Washoe County Library welcomes you to our monthly series from the Historic Reno Preservation Society. Tonight's topic is Jeff Schumacher discusses fact, fiction, and Howard Hughes. My name is Samantha and I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. Washoe County Library System and Historic Reno Preservation Society will feature a different topic and speaker the first Tuesday of every month through April. Next month's topic is Dr. Heidi Swink presents Rural Nevada Projects. This will be on Tuesday, March 2nd at 5.30. Be sure to sign up at events.washoecountylibrary.us. And now I would like to introduce Carol Coleman with the Historic Reno Preservation Society. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Samantha. Well, welcome to another uh, Historic Reno Preservation Society historic program. My name is Carol Coleman and I'm president of HARPS. And tonight I'm also standing in for Sherry Hayes Zorn, who's the uh, coordinator for all of our education programs. Uh, if you're a member of HARPS, I hope you got the winter footprints with a focus on the Lear and Riverside Drive. And I hope you got the February monthly email newsletter uh, that's going out the first of every month with a lot of useful information uh, about historic preservation events you can uh, link to. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a talk on Howard Hughes. Uh, it comes partly, oh, in large part, from the book that Jeff Schumacher wrote about Howard Hughes, and he now has an expanded edition. Uh, Jeff is currently the vice president of exhi exhibits and programs at the Mob Museum. He spent 25 years at, in journalism as a reporter and an editor. Uh, and he also is the, on the editorial board of N Nevada Historical Society's Quarterly, which I think many of you subscribe to. So I want to uh, welcome Jeff and uh, turn it over to Jeff Schumacher. You're on, Jeff. Thank you, thank you, Carol. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to, uh, I ought to add one more uh, uh, biographical note, which is that uh, I graduated, I got my undergrad from University of Nevada, Reno. So go well back. And although we won't talk uh, a ton about Reno tonight, uh, I do have a few uh, tidbits in that area or Northern Nevada tidbits that we can, uh, that we'll bring into this discussion. Um, so good evening. Thank you for taking the time for this presentation. I hope to shed a little fresh light on the life and times of Howard Hughes, especially in regard to his influence on our state. Uh, but I have to warn you, this presentation will be a little bit all over the place uh, tonight. Uh, first of all, I, I simply cannot do justice to Howard Hughes's entire life and the amount of time allotted. I mean, he he's did so many interesting and amazing things over his, the course of his his life. Um, really, one of the most uh, interesting characters of the 20th century. Um, so uh, we can't can't cover everything. And and second, I have to uh, be transparent and let you know that I've I've pieced together this presentation from uh, three other presentations that I've done over the years on Howard Hughes. So uh, there are different aspects of his life that we're gonna cover tonight and other areas that we may not cover. And uh, so if you have any questions about the things we don't cover, maybe we can hit those at the end. Uh, but uh, I know I've skipped over, I will have skipped over some important things. So we can, we can try to patch that up at the end. So I wanna start by uh, explaining this slide uh, that you see now. Uh, I first published a book about Howard Hughes in 2008. Uh, perhaps a, a few of you have seen or read this hardcover edition on the left side uh, of the screen. Uh, the one on the right is a revised and expanded trade paperback edition of the book that came out in March of last year from the University of Nevada Press. Naturally, uh, considering the timing of its release, I've not been able to do a whole lot of promotion of uh, the new book over the past year. So thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to talk about it. The book, the new book has, has five new chapters and, and all the other chapters were revised 
uh, in one way or another uh, to make it into a better book. Uh, to give you an idea, the first edition of the book was 100,000 words. Uh, the second edition is about 128,000 words. And those are the new, that constitutes the new chapters as well as new information that I really picked up over the, you know, the 10 years since the first book was published. I, you know, the story of Howard Hughes continues to unfold, really. There's a lot of new uh, things that I learned since the first edition was published, and I was able to share those uh, in this new edition. We'll start sort of with the basics on Howard Hughes. You know, he was born in 1905. That happens to be the same year that really Las Vegas was born. So I, I certainly make that point in the book. Uh, it's a very Las Vegas centric book uh, because we the goal of my uh, book is to sort of show the influence of Howard Hughes on, on Las Vegas and the state of Nevada, more so than giving you a general biography. Uh, but he was born in 1905 in Humble, Texas. That's a, a suburb of Houston. Uh, his father, Howard Hughes Sr., actually grew up in Keokuk, Iowa. If anybody's originally from Iowa on the, uh, uh, on the uh, stream tonight, uh, Keokuk's in the far south, southeast corner of uh, Iowa on the Mississippi River. And then his mother, though, was Arlene Gano. She was from Dallas, Texas, and she was the uh, daughter of a, a judge, a very, very uh, elegant and uh, sophisticated uh, woman. And Howard Sr., his father, uh, when he was a young man, he, he really wasn't sure what he wanted to do. He had a short stint at Harvard. He was obviously very bright. He, he went to Harvard for about a year, uh, dropped out of there and came back to Iowa uh, and ended up at the Iowa College of Law. Uh, but he only stayed there for a short time. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, looking for his calling in life, his his father, who uh, was a lawyer, brought him into his own law firm in Keokuk, and Howard Sr. managed to pass the bar and work briefly as a lawyer. Uh, but it didn't last long. This was a, a, an individual who had much uh, higher ambitions than you know, Keokuk, Iowa. And uh, as he told uh, later in life, he was uh, asked about his career by Harvard, and he said, uh, he found the law too exacting a mistress for a man of my talent. In other words, it was too difficult. And he decided to seek his fortune, quote, under the surface of the earth. And so that's where we get into his interest in, in mining. Uh, he traveled uh, for several years through several states uh, looking for a way to, uh, to make his fortune in mining. He finally settled uh, in Houston. Uh, which was the center at that time of, and still is really, of the fledgling oil industry. After years of prospecting for oil, Howard Sr. came upon another way to get rich in the industry. He got the idea for a new kind of oil drill bit from a man he met in a bar in Shreveport, Louisiana. The man sold him a model of his idea for $150. This guy had cobbled together this idea for an oil drill bit sold it to him for $150. Howard Sr. immediately took the model back to Keokuk to seek his father's legal and financial help to secure a patent for the drill bit. He famously, this is the sort of legendary origin story of the family's fortune. He sat down at the dining room table and sketched out detailed drawings of the device as well as technical documents. He ultimately received patents for the drill bit in 1909 uh, when Howard Jr. was about four years old. The huge, rotor, the huge rotary bit, that's what this picture shows, was a huge success because it bored into hard rock better and faster than any other bit. Oil companies could drill deeper into the earth in search of oil than ever before. So this uh, device became the foundation of the family fortune. And these drill bits are essentially still used today. Obviously, they've made some improvements over the years. As a young man, Howard Jr. was known as Sonny. That was to differentiate him from his father's name. Uh, he was kind of sickly in his youth, but uh, a lot of uh, biographers believe this has, that his mother had something to do with this. She was uh, a, a, you know, a, a hypochondriac, 
uh, at the extreme level. And so she certainly thought she had her own ailments, but she also saw her uh, son uh, uh, with the same problems and, and treated him as such. But Howard Jr. eventually uh, became more athletic and outgoing. And as a teenager, he excelled in science and engineering, uh, including uh, building a motorized bicycle when he was 13 years old. That's this picture here. It was, it was such a, a feat uh, that uh, earned him a story in the, in the, no, in the Houston newspaper. Uh, they said it was the first motorized bicycle in Houston. This was a time when there, there were several uh, innovations along these lines going on around the country and, and Howard was right at the forefront of that. Hughes's parents died uh, when he was still a teenager. Uh, first, his mother died in 1922. She was hemorrhaging and receiving anesthesia in the hospital when she passed. She was only 38 years old at the time. Uh, then his father died in 1924 of an embolism. He was only 54 years old. Uh, I happen to be 55 right now. So that, that's a very young uh, age for passing away. Uh, when his father died, uh, Howard Jr. was 18 years old and he was attending the California Institute of Technology at the time. Well, rather than sort of just continue his schooling and, and allow other family members to take over the, the family company, his father's company, he decided to drop out of college and, and take control of Hughes Tool Company. But this was, this was no easy feat, especially then. I mean, he was 18 years old. Who was gonna trust him with this huge company at that age? So he had to convince his family members uh, that he could do it and ultimately a judge that he was capable of taking on this huge responsibility. And he pulled it off. Uh, and in 1925, he started his epic climb into American history. For all the wealth they provided, uh, oil drill bits did not particularly interest Howard Jr. This was his father's passion was mining. It wasn't necessarily his. Living in Southern California in the 1920s, by far the biggest thing going was the movies, the movie business. He was wanted to make movies. So he created a company and started making them. It didn't start well. His first movie was called Swell Hogan. Uh, it was not good. It was, it was bad. It was so bad, in fact, that it was never released. And really nobody alive has ever seen it. It went into the vault never to be seen again. Um, but Hughes was undeterred. He, he decided he needed to study filmmaking more uh, and he uh, become a better judge of talent. So his next film, Everybody's Acting, was much better. It was released in 1926, and it was a financial success. His third film, Two Arabian Nights, released in 1927, was even better. And remember, these are silent films at the time. Uh, but uh, Two Arabian Nights earned its director, Lewis Milestone, a Best Director Award at the second ever Academy Award. So even though uh, Howard Hughes is still seen as a small fry in Hollywood. His, his movies are now catching people's attention because they're, they're winning awards. Most of the intersections between Howard Hughes uh, and the mob, and by the way, since I work at the Mob Museum, we're going to talk about organized crime a little bit in relation to Howard Hughes uh, in this presentation. Uh, most of the intersections between Howard Hughes and the mob revolve around his life as a Hollywood filmmaker. The mob apparently was not particularly interested in aviation or oil drill bits, uh, but the mob loved the movies. One of the biggest movies Hughes ever made was Hell's Angels, a World War I epic starring Gene Harlow. Hughes did not discover Harlow, who had done one movie before Hell's Angels, but she, he did make her a star. The mob connection here is Abner Longy Zwillman. Uh, Zwillman is not as well known today, but he was a longtime friend and associate of Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky, two of the biggest uh, names in mob history. In the 1930s, uh, Zwillman took over Dutch Schultz's rackets in New Jersey and earned the nickname the Al Capone of New Jersey. Well, Zwillman met Harlow in Chicago and they became a couple. He showered her with gifts, including a red Cadillac. 
there's really no evidence of any conflict between Zillman, Zwillman and Hughes, largely, be, largely because despite some gossip at the time, Hughes and Harlow were never an item. Um, one other interesting note about Jean Harlow, uh, she was the godmother of Millicent Siegel, Bugsy Siegel's daughter. And uh, Bugsy Siegel's daughter, you know, did a program at the museum some years ago. She's now passed away, but uh, she uh, just loved Jean Harlow as a child and, and really thought of her so fondly. And she would talk uh, a lot about her. Hughes does not uh, get enough credit for essentially inventing the mob movie. Um, so, you know, we obviously have movies that followed uh, this movie, The Racket, which came out in 1928 that we all are familiar with, The Godfather and, you know, Goodfellas and Casino and, of course, The Sopranos on television. But they're all started, uh, most movie historians believe, with this movie, The Racket. Uh, it was a very realistic look at the intersection between mobsters and police and government corruption. It was so realistic that the censors freaked out about it. Uh, the movie was outright banned in Chicago uh, which may have been the most corrupt city in the country at the time. So Hughes was again on the cutting edge here. The bicycle, motorized bicycle, now we have a cutting edge movie. The racket was based on a 1927 Broadway play by a former Chicago newspaper reporter named Bartlett Cormack. A young Edward G. Robinson had a small role in the play. Well, Cormac moved to Hollywood in 1928 to work with Hughes on the screenplay version of The Racket. A couple of years later, later, years later, Hughes hired him again to work on the script of The Front Page, which has become a classic movie, of course. It's also worth mentioning that The Racket was directed by Lewis Milestone. Milestone, uh, just a, a legendary uh, movie director uh, for many years, and he would go on to direct uh, toward the end of his career, a little movie called Ocean's Eleven, which came out in 1960 and featured uh, the Rat Pack. So, uh, you know, Howard Hughes uh, hooked up with Milestone very early in his, in his career and, and, to, and to great effect. Um, so it played, a, it's fair to say that Howard Hughes played a big role in promoting Milestone's Hollywood career. Just a quick note that um, like so many silent movies, for many years, people feared uh, that the racket was lost. Uh, but after Hughes died in 1976, his company, Summa Corporation, uh, donated his film collection to UNLV's film department. A copy of the racket, probably the only one in existence, was found in the collection. The film was digitally restored and debuted in 2004 on Turner Mo Classic Movies. Um, and incidentally, uh, UNLV learned uh, uh, about last year that it's receiving a big grant. It has received a big grant to catalog the Hughes movie collection. There will be a few years before that gets done, but once it's ready, it will be a treasure trove of material for historians and film buffs to study, including me. I, I plan to dive in there and, and, know, and learn more about it. Um, I just, this uh, particular, uh, slide you see now is the remake, the movie remake of The Racket that came out in 1951. This is the, this is the collection uh, that at UNLV. So they've got some work to do to get this uh, uh, cleaned up. So now we get to the, to the big movie uh, that Hughes made at this time. And, and again, we're, we're gonna move as quickly as I can through these movies, but uh, I think it's such an important part of Hughes's life and it, and it plays into what ends up happening in Nevada later with organized crime. So uh, the story of, of Scarface really begins with a novel written by a man named Armitage Trail. The author's real name was Maurice Coons. Trail's brother Hannibal wrote a forward to a paperback edition of the novel, that's what's pictured here, in which he talked about how his brother came to write it. He said, uh, his brother, he wrote and sold stories about gangsters long before he'd ever seen a gangster. He didn't actually see any until we got to Chicago. That would have been around 1925. He said, my brother was always interested in gangsters as other men are interested in posted stamps, old coins, or spread eagled butterflies. We lived in a large apartment in extremely respectable 
Oak Park. For the next year or more, my brother spent most of his nights prowling the uh, Chicago's gangland with his friend, the lawyer, and he spent his days sitting in the sunroom of the Oak Park apartment writing Scarface. He spent evenings beyond number with gangsters and their families. He met their mothers. Most of them were very good to their mothers. Um, he prowled Chicago's gangland until he knew enough about gangsters and about Capone, the top gangster of them all, to write Scarface. Um, so th this novel was published in 1929, and then Trail sold the rights to Howard Hughes in 1930 for about $25,000, which a lot of money at the time. Uh, sadly, Trail did not live to see the movie. He died of a heart attack in Los Angeles at age 28. So for, for Scarface, he was landed the ideal screenwriter for the job, Ben Hecht, man on the left. Hecht also was a former crime reporter in Chicago who had a knack for crackling dialogue and fast paced narratives like Scarface. He really was a more seasoned version of Armitage Trail. He was wanted Howard Hawks, person on the right, to direct Scarface, but there was a problem. Hughes was suing Hawks at the time. Not long after Hughes produced Hell's Angels, Hawks made a World War I uh, movie called The Dawn Patrol. Hawks had hired a lot of the aviation experts and cameramen whom Hughes had used to make his film. And Hughes claimed that the Dawn Patrol even contained some of his Hell's Angels footage. Well, because Hughes wanted Hawks so much for, this, for Scarface, he agreed to drop the lawsuit if Hawks would direct Scarface, and he did. It was clear from the script that Scarface was going to be a very violent film by early 1930s standards, and Will Hayes, the movie censor, refused to approve it. Hayes demanded changes. He wanted less violence and for the story not to glorify criminals. Hugh Hawks refused to budge, but Hughes, having invested $600,000 in the movie already, initially agreed to some changes, including changing the ending and changing the name of the movie to Scarface, The Shame of the Nation. You might have heard that uh, when, if you've ever seen the movie, you might have seen a version that has that title. Uh, but Hayes was still not satisfied. So Hughes got frustrated. He ordered his team to restore the movie to its original version. <laughs> um, but then Hughes had to uh, contend with state movie censorship boards as well. Some states allowed the film to be shown, while others refused. Hughes sued several states that would not allow the movie. Multiple versions of Scarface were circulating around the country uh, to satisfy the various censors. The movie debuted in New Orleans and Los Angeles, and the reviews were enthusiastic. People loved it. Uh, Hughes also received praise for fighting for free speech. The, he had a famous quote, which, uh, which really made, a, I think, a very compelling case for what we ultimately came to believe about movies, which was to have a lot more freedom about what you could what you could show. He said, it becomes a serious threat to the freedom of honest expression in America when self-styled guardians of the public welfare, as personified by our film censor boards, lend their influence to the abortive efforts of selfish and vicious interests to suppress a motion picture simply because it depicts the truths about conditions in this country. So eventually Hayes relented and approved the movie and it opened around the country in 1932. Interestingly, Scarface was still banned in Chicago until 1941, when it finally appeared there and set attendance records. I want to brief, I'll very briefly uh, mention this. Uh, Howard Hawks, uh, the director of the movie, uh, told uh, an interviewer that uh, he had uh, representatives of Al Capone had come out to California and told, and told him the boss wants to see the picture. Hawks told them Capone could buy a ticket to see the movie in the theater, like everybody else. Nonetheless, they invited him to meet Capone in Chicago. Uh, the fearless director and the mob boss met in a cafe. And Hawks said, when I met Capone, we had tea. And he was dressed in a morning coat, striped trousers, a carnation, being a very nice man, saying how much he liked the picture. I was with him two or three hours. Hawks said Capone saw the movie several times. He had his own print of it. He thought it was great. He'd say, Jesus, you guys got a lot of, the, a lot of stuff in that picture. How'd you, how'd you know about that? I said, 
look, you know how somebody can't testify if he's a lawyer? Well, I'm a lawyer. And he laughed. He didn't, he didn't care. So Hawks, who made dozens of movies during his career, uh, later described Scarface as his favorite because he and Howard Hughes made the film without A-list actors or the support of a big studio. He said everybody uh, was under contract to the studios, he said. So that's why they had to find others. Uh, we couldn't get a studio and they wouldn't loan us anybody. So we had to find a cast. They just didn't want independent pictures made in Hollywood. So we rented a little cobweb studio and opened it up and made the picture. It turned out to be the big picture of the year and we didn't get help from anybody. Uh, Scarface launched George Raft's career. Uh, he plays, of course, the Al Capone character second in command, and he plays the role of a, with a quiet menace. He famously is seen flipping a coin uh, uh, in most of the scenes he's in. Uh, Raft, uh, you know, grew up in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. As a teenager, he worked as a dancer in nightclubs owned by mobsters. Uh, he was also a driver for Oni Madden, who was a, a famed mobster in New York. Uh, and it was it was only Madden who suggested that George Raft ought to uh, go to Hollywood and try to to break into the movie business. Um, Raft, uh, interesting, almost blew his big role in Scarface, uh, and the situation had everything to do with Howard Hughes. In his biography, Raft explained that during the production of Scarface, Howard Hughes visited the set several times. And though Raft respected Hughes, even liked the young producer, he also lost his part because of an unintentional interference in the aviator's personal life. In the late 20s, Raft had met Billy Dove, who was then Jimmy Walker's companion. Jimmy Walker was a, a, a kind of a, a do nothing uh, uh, politician in uh, New York. The three of them saw each other often at Legs Diamond's Hotsy Totsy Club. When Billy Dove came to Hollywood, she renewed her acquaintance with Raft uh, on a more intimate basis. Raft explains, I took her out. One thing led to another. And we wound up in a gorgeous suite at the Ambassador Hotel. And then the phone rang. It's a pal calling from the lobby. Nervously, he tells him that Billy Dove was Howard Hughes's girlfriend, and that Hughes was in the lobby at that moment looking for her. Believe me, I didn't even know that she knew Hughes. If I had, I wouldn't have gone near her. She was pretty upset when I told her what was happening since the last guy in the world either of us wanted to cross was Howard Hughes. So as gracefully as I could, I said my goodbyes to Billy, slipped down the service elevator and beat it home. So uh, fortunately for George Raft, he didn't have to deal with that situation. Uh, this is Raft, this is Billy Dove. She was a silent film actress, quite successful in those years. I show this picture here because I like it. <laughs> uh, this is in 1932 and the construction of Hoover Dam is well underway. Uh, the workers are living in the new company town of Boulder City, uh, which does not allow alcohol or gambling. But the Boulder City movie theater is showing Scarface, the most violent and controversial movie in the country at the time. So interesting uh, uh, juxtaposition there. After Hughes died in 1976, his estate sold the rights to Universal Pictures, which showed it at the New York Film Festival in 1979, then made it available as a home video. So that's when Scarface came back into circulation. But the real benefit for Universal came a few years later. By purchasing the rights to Scarface, it was allowed to do a remake, which came in the form of the 1983 movie of the same name starring Al Pacino. I'm sure most people have seen that movie. And just to understand that there's a direct tie to Howard Hughes, I think adds a whole new uh, aspect to it. Hughes got to know a man named Billy Wilkerson in the early 1930s after Wilkerson launched the Hollywood Reporter newspaper. As a movie mogul, he was regularly bought advertising in the Hollywood Reporter. He was known to bail out Wilkerson by purchasing additional advertising when the publisher ran into money problems. So they were friends. Always obsessed with how he was portrayed in the press, he was talked Wilkerson into allowing him to preview news stories related to his affairs. As uh, Billy Wilkerson's son explained in, in a memoir, a, biogra a biography of his father, first Hughes would telephone to ask whether there was anything about him in the paper that day. 
if he decided there was reason for concern, he would arrive at the press room around eight o'clock as the paper was being put to bed. The press room had received strict instructions to hold the presses while Hughes reviewed the plates in search of references to himself. Now, Wilkerson wasn't in the mob, but he had personal and business relationships with many uh, mobsters dating to his days running speakeasies in New York uh, during Prohibition. Um, Wilkerson actively participated uh, in the Hollywood studio extortion racket in the late 1930s and early 40s, along with a number of mobsters, including uh, Johnny Roselli. But while those individuals were caught, convicted, and sent to prison, Wilkerson escaped prosecution. In 1945, Wilkerson purchased 33 acres outside Las Vegas with a plan to build a hotel casino called the Flamingo. Needing investors, Wilkerson approached his friend Howard Hughes, who agreed to give him $200,000 in the form of prepaid advertising contract in the Hollywood Reporter. At the time, Wilkerson had already retained the services of the mob-connected Gus Greenbaum and Mo Sedway to run the Flamingo. Uh, Wilkerson may have been able to get the Flamingo built with some help from bank loans and friends like Howard Hughes, but he had a big problem. Wilkerson lost tens of thousands of dollars at the gaming tables down the road from the Flamingo construction site. With the project practically stalled, Sedway alerted his New York boss, Meyer Lansky, to the Flamingo crisis. Sedway convinced Lansky that Flamingo could be a financial success uh, for the mob. So Lansky and a few partners offered Wilkerson $1 million to finish the resort, with Wilkerson retaining creative and managerial control. This arrangement suited Wilkerson, but a month later, Lansky assigned a childhood friend of his to keep an eye on the mob's considerable investment, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. The rest of this story is well known. Siegel and Wilkerson started out as friendly collaborators, but Siegel took such a liking to the Flamingo that he pushed Wilkerson out of the picture. He even threatened his life, and Wilkerson fled to Paris for a time. At that point, Siegel took full control of construction, and he ended up going several million dollars over budget to make the Flamingo bigger and more elegant than Wilkerson had ever envisioned. The Flamingo opened on December 26, 1946, uh, but its hotel rooms were not finished yet. Initially, the Flamingo suffered financially and Siegel had to shutter it until the hotel rooms were finished. Uh, Siegel tested the patience of his partners seemingly at every turn. And on June 20th, 1947, Siegel was assassinated while sitting on the couch in his girlfriend Virginia Hill's house in Beverly Hills, California. As for Wilkerson, he returned from Paris five days after Siegel's death. In the years to come, he would take a leading role alongside Howard Hughes in the crusade to rid Hollywood of alleged communists. Wilkerson and Hughes remained friends throughout the 1950s, and Wilkerson's son remembered Hughes visiting their house. Quote, when I was a young boy, Howard Hughes was a frequent caller at our home. I used to watch him drive up our driveway from my second floor bedroom window. It, was, it always took him several minutes to park his car using an arcane ritual back and forth and back and forth. He was obsessed about parking it as close to the courtyard wall as possible. And for those who know a little, little uh, bit about Howard Hughes, you know he, he really suffered from an obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, this you know, plagued him most of his life. And this is an example of that. I haven't spoken extensively uh, uh, about how Bob Mayhew, but uh, he was uh, really Hughes's right-hand man uh, and connection to the mob during Hughes's Las Vegas years. Uh, Mayhew was the intermediary as Hughes invested hundreds of million, millions of dollars in Las Vegas in the late 1960s. Here's Rosselli. When Hughes moved to Las Vegas, he wanted to make investments, but he did not plan to spend his money on casinos. That was not his original intention. Uh, that changed after Mo Dalitz, who ran the Desert Inn, where Hughes occupied the penthouse floor, wanted the billionaire to vacate the premises. Hughes balked. He didn't want to go. When Dalitz, a Cleveland syndicate boss, threatened to send the sheriff to physically remove Hughes, Bob Mayhew turned to an old friend, mobster Johnny Roselli, to calm everybody down. 
Roselli achieved this by contacting Teamsters union boss, Jimmy Hoffa, who called Modelitz and persuaded him to allow Hughes to stay. But if Hughes wanted to stay in the penthouse permanently, he would have to buy the hotel. Mayhew, with Roselli's help, engineered that deal. After many years representing Chicago outfit interests in Hollywood, Roselli was sent to Las Vegas in, in 1957. Roselli had tinkered in Las Vegas before, but now he would be Chicago's main man in Las Vegas. And Roselli got a lot more done with charm and guile than with violence. So with Daylitz threatening to physically remove Hughes, Mayhew turned to Roselli for help. Roselli was like a key to the city, Mayhew said, the ultimate mob fixer in the desert. Roselli served as a key player in the negotiations for Hughes to buy the Desert Inn. And for his services, Roselli received a fee of $50,000. Uh, at, at that point, Roselli also wanted Bob Mayhew to appoint him manager of the Desert Inn Casino, but Mayhew adamantly opposed the idea. They got into a heated argument over this, and uh, he, you know, Mayhew knew what the problem would be to play the known mobster in charge of the casino was not going to work. That all that said, Roselli also helped engineer Hughes's purchases of the Sands and the Frontier hotels. For the Sands deal, Roselli received a forty-five thousand dollar fee, and for the Frontier, instead of a fee, Roselli was handed the lease for the gift shop, which netted him about $60,000 per year for the rest of his life, pretty good deal. As the mob's point man in Las Vegas, Roselli was involved in all kinds of behind the scenes activities. Before Hughes purchased the Silver Slipper Casino, it was owned by Shelby Williams and Jack Shapiro, the latter of whom was tied to the Detroit mafia. Uh, so, and Roselli worked out that deal for Hughes as well. Hughes ultimately bought six hotels and casinos in Las Vegas, the Desert Inn, Sands, Frontier, Silver Slipper, Castaways, and Landmark. In each case, he acquired the property from individuals associated to one degree or another with organized crime. Yet these acquisitions of these properties were the closest interactions that Hughes ever had with the mob, but it's unlikely he ever spoke with any of these sellers. I uh, handled everything through Bob Mayhew. Here's where we, we get a, a localized moment. Um, you know, the other hotel casino that he was purchased was Harold's Club in Reno in 1970. And what's interesting about that is the $11 million acquisition, in addition to the hotel casino down on Virginia Street, he also got a cabin at Lake Tahoe and a trap shooting club in what is today Spanish Springs. And some of you may be familiar with each of those. Here's what's important to know about the cabin at Lake Tahoe. There is zero evidence that he was ever stepped foot there in there. You know, by that time he was he was, you know, staying on the in the penthouse of the Desert Inn Hotel and there he wasn't leaving. And uh, you know, he he was not someone who even met with people other than the closest aides that he had who were taking care of his daily needs. So, he never stepped foot in that on that building in that cabin. And uh, this goes contrary to all the real estate marketing that occurred <laughs> a couple of years ago when this house went up for sale, including one ad that claimed that Hughes lived there continuously from 1950 to his death in 1976. Well, he didn't buy the house until 1970. And, uh, and at that point, he never stayed there. Now, we do know that his uh, wife at the time, Jean Peters, did stay there for a brief time uh, before she and Howard got divorced in 1971. They also used it for some of the Harold's Club high rollers uh, and they occasionally the, the staff, the Hughes staff would use the, use the house. Um, interestingly, Hughes, uh, uh, when he was building his casino empire, he no negotiated a deal to acquire another mob connected property, the Stardust uh, for $30.5 $30 million, however, the Justice Department's antitrust division raised alarms that Hughes was gaining a monopoly control of the Las Vegas casino industry, and the deal fell through. They weren't going to allow it. And, you know, considering what happened at the Stardust in the 1970s and early 1980s, which is, of course, depicted uh, in the movie Casino, uh, the Justice Department could have saved a lot of time and money if it allowed Hughes to go ahead and buy 
by the Stardust. And in any case, the Stardust went into, it ultimately became owned in the early 70s by the Argent Corporation, which was a front for the Chicago outfit. And, you know, Frank Lefty Rosenthal, uh, the Robert De Niro character, uh, was placed in charge. And, to and Tony Spilatro uh, was uh, the Chicago mob's uh, enforcer in Las Vegas. And, and the rest is history. They skimmed millions of dollars uh, out of the Stardust. I'm going to I'm going to truncate what I have to say about this next slide, just to say that there's a lot of debate about whether the mob continued to skim uh, from the casinos that that Hughes owned in the from 68 to 76, and uh, there are uh, uh, plenty of sources who will say that the mob did skim continue to skim behind the scenes from Hughes and his corp, even though it was a corporate entity that they were still had people on the inside skimming from the hotel. The problem is actual evidence. Uh, there isn't a lot of it to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hearsay, right? It's, it's one word person's word against another. And Bob Mayhew always insisted that that did not happen, that uh, the, the accounting controls were so careful that the mob could not have, uh, have skimmed from the casinos. I happen to think there probably was, were mob people still involved with the casinos and there may have been some some funny business going on behind the scenes, uh, in part because as soon as these casinos were owned by Howard Hughes, they started losing money. <laughs> and uh, this was very alarming. And, and the IRS, ultimately, its investigation uh, contended that skimming must have been going on because otherwise, where did all the money go? Now, we can't leave tonight without talking for a minute or two about Howard Hughes's germophobia. Uh, after all, we're in a global pandemic. And all of us are having the, the, the kinds of thoughts that haunted Howard Hughes later in his life. As we all deal with having to stay at home and keep our distance, consider that Hughes lived in self-imposed quarantine for the last 20 years of his life. A little more than that, really. He always said this was his way of avoiding interruptions and distractions, uh, but it clearly was more than that. His addiction to painkillers, his paranoia, and his germophobia took over his life to the point where he often did not feel comfortable being seen by other people. It's a sad thing considering that his favorite thing in the world was to fly airplanes, something we haven't talked about a lot tonight. Just think of the freedom of movement he enjoyed having his own planes and being able to fly them whenever he wanted and wherever he wanted to go. It's hard to imagine that he consciously chose to give all that up in order to live an uninter uninterrupted life in small hotel rooms in Los Angeles and Boston and Las Vegas and the Bahamas and Nicaragua and London. These were the places he lived in the latter part of his life. Always hotel rooms, uh, very limited access to people and, and never going outside, almost never, uh, except to go from one place to the next. Um, so something to think about uh, when you look at people like Howard Hughes and, and how he died, uh, uh, it reminds me of Elvis Presley and, and, the, and the, what happened to him. It, ha it reminds me of Michael Jackson and, and what happened to him and just how you have all these yes men around him. Nobody's really uh, doing anything about what they see in front of their face about what's happening to this individual uh, because he's rich, because he's famous, because he's, he's scary to them. You know, they don't speak up. And that's uh, the sort of the tragedy of Howard Hughes uh, uh, that uh, we can, I certainly welcome any questions on that part of his life. But uh, why don't we uh, go ahead and wrap it up there and hopefully take some questions. Okay, real interesting. I didn't know that much about Howard Hughes. So it was great to uh, get filled in and all of his mob connections. I have a question here about the Tahoe cabin. Where was that on the lake? It, I think it's in Crystal Bay, and I'm not an expert on Lake Tahoe, but I believe that's where it was, okay. or it is, where it is to this day. Yeah, that would, that would, I think Crystal Bay is on the east side, so that would make sense with connection um, yeah, no, I, will, I will say that, you know, he was never went, never went to that cabin. There was plenty of time there. But 
in, in the earlier years, he did uh, go to the Cal, you know, the Cal Neva Club, the Cal Neva Lodge, I'm sorry, the Cal Neva Lodge up at North Lake Tahoe, where a lot of people, you know, from Hollywood would go uh, for vacations and whatnot. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he was, was definitely, uh, definitely a visitor there. Okay. Um, did he have any children? Mm -hmm. the, the short answer to that question is no. Um, however, uh, we have a report, and I talk about this in the book. Uh, there was an actress named Terry Moore, and Terry Moore uh, has written a couple of memoirs about her life. And she, when she was a very young woman, she, in 1948, 49, 50, in that area, uh, she had an affair with, with Howard Hughes. And, and she contends that uh, she became uh, pregnant by him twice, uh, but in each time, each time she miscarried, and um, and and so there is the possible there was the possibility of of children based on Terry Moore's story, uh, mm -hmm. but there are uh, no no heirs uh, of that kind after he died. Uh, nobody was a, with no legitimate claims came forward. Because he was involved with a lot of different women in Hollywood, was he not? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I could do a, uh, a whole talk just about that. <laughs> yes, he, um, you know, he had uh, many, almost, you know, it's funny, let me tell a story about that. So my wife loves TCM, the channel, right? So we have that channel on at home all the time. And uh, it's all black and white movies from the 30s and 40s, mostly 50s. And uh, it almost goes without fail that she'll be watching a movie and I'll see one of the actresses in the movie and say, oh, she dated Howard Hughes. <laughs> or she, she almost married Howard Hughes. I mean, name you can almost name an actress from that era and Howard Hughes had an affair with that person or at least one date. <laughs> uh, but one of the loves of his life was Catherine Hepburn. And from, I think, 36 to 38, he was pretty, uh, they were pretty serious. But huh. the, problem, the problem was each of them had their own careers, their own lives that they were living. And uh, they, you know, they, Howard Hughes could, could not be tied down and neither could Catherine Hepburn to a permanent relationship, it seemed, at that time. And so they ended up breaking up amicably. <laughs> well, I, there are several questions related to wives. So <clears throat> one was how many wives? Mm -hmm. um, and how, yes, how many times was he married? So he was he was married twice, and um, the first, so you remember I was talking about when he was very young and his parents died, mm -hmm. and he wanted to take over uh, his his father's company. One of the things that he did at that time was, in order to sort of show how mature he was and how much of an adult he was, is he he got married. Uh, to uh, Ella Rice. And if you've heard of Rice University, she was a, an heir to the Rice University fortune, Rice fortune. And um, he married her in Houston and, and brought her out to California. And uh, unfortunately, that was not meant to be. And one of the reasons for that was he was, became, you know, he was a playboy. He was a playboy in Hollywood in the, in the very loose and rollicking 1920s, late 20s. And if you've heard or read anything about that era in Hollywood, uh, it was nothing like, it was like the 60s later for the rest of us. I mean, it was extremely loose and casual uh, culture there. And so Howard Hughes was having affairs all over the place. He was never home. And so that, that uh, marriage did not last. How um, long did it go on? I think they were married for uh, uh, four years. Four years, okay. Um, four years. Now, uh, uh, later in 1957, and there is a Nevada tie to this, uh, he, he married a woman named Jean Peters. And Jean Peters was also an actress. He had dated her on and off before that. Uh, he ended up marrying her in Tonopah uh, <laughs> uh, in 1957. And he did that because he didn't want a crowd. He didn't want to draw a crowd to the wedding. Uh, so they adopted fake names, literally, and flew up to, 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 uh, to Tonopah and got married there in 1957. Later, it was, you know, he, uh, he was actually leaked the story to the Hollywood uh, gossip press and, and it got out that, he, that they were married. But 
uh, and the, it's a very strange relationship that he had with Gene Peters. They, they really did love each other, most people agree, but they only lived together a very short amount of time during their marriage. They were married from 1957 to 1971, but they only lived together for maybe a couple of years during that time. And it, it had to do with Hughes's just, you know, his, his increasing uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, his, his germophobia, his fear of people, and, uh, and going out, you know, Gene was a regular person and he wasn't. And uh, so they lived apart, uh, again, uh, uh, loved each other and everything. They just couldn't live together. Uh, and ultimately they got divorced in 1971. And, uh, and it, was, it was not a, a huge divorce conflict where she demanded, you know, half the money. She got a very, a very uh, to her mind, satisfying settlement and lived out the rest of her life very comfortably. Uh, mm -hmm. without him but yeah two two marriages now Terry Moore I, I mentioned her earlier earlier she claims that he she and he and uh, Howard were married on a, a ship off the coast of California back in 1950 but it's clear as day to anyone looking at it today that it was a scam by Howard because uh, he wanted to uh, you know he wanted to uh, complete the marriage if you will with young Terry Moore, and she would only allow that if they were married. Yeah. And uh, so that's what that was about. Yeah. So and the, you mentioned the germophobia. Was that always a problem with him, or happened more in later years? I think it. I think it. Uh, most most uh, uh, biographers agree that it really started with his his mother. His mother uh, was afraid uh, that of everything, that everything was going to hurt her son, that, you know, he was going to, he was going to catch germs, uh, anything that he did, uh, any, and he was always, in her mind, he was always sickly, he always needed her, uh, you know, her attention. Um, now, he escaped that, and I think, um, uh, you know, in his young, as a young adult, I think he, he was able to get away from a lot of this, but after he had a, almost, uh, uh, he almost died in a, a, a airplane accident in 1946, uh, he started taking painkillers and he ultimately became addicted to them and started mixing them with other drugs. And this really exacerbated his obsessive compulsive disorder uh, as well as his paranoia and all the things that go along with you know, these, uh, these afflictions. So uh, the germophobia became very extreme when he got to Las Vegas uh, and you know, he had a weird, he was, he was deathly afraid of atomic testing, for example. And even so though the test, Las Vegas? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He moved to Las Vegas, NDS. but <laughs> yeah, they, they were underground tests at that time, uh, by the time he got there uh, in 1966. But he, you know, he lobbied the president of the United States to stop a uh, nuclear testing uh, in Nevada because he, he argued that it was uh, going to hurt the economy you know, here. But uh, what it ultimately was is he was deathly afraid of the radiation from the atomic mm -hmm. test. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's a question that's about to go off the top of this chat. Uh, the, the Hollywood picture, there's smoke on top of a hill, a factory or a train? I don't know. Do you know uh, anything, what they're talking about? Oh, it's, I haven't studied, you know, that picture is, uh, I haven't studied that picture. You're talking about the Hollywood, Hollywood sign. I think uh, that must be it. Yeah. I don't have any great information about that picture. I'm sorry, but I do know, I do, I can tell you that that picture is believed to have been taken in 1925. So that is exactly when Howard Hughes uh, started uh, his, his adult life in, in Los uh -huh. Angeles. So I tried to tie it with the era. Okay, uh, question about his father's company and then I suppose his company. How, how did Hughes Tool Company make money beyond the patent on, on the drill bit? That is a great question. Um, so one of the, the really wise things that, that uh, Howard Hughes Sr. did was he didn't just sell these drill bits, he leased them and he leased them out. So he retained control and so he could make money continuously off of these drill bits. Uh, and um, so, you know, he obviously was uh, later in later years, 
and up to this day, I believe you can still get essentially a Hughes, uh, Hughes drill bit today. Uh, I think it's, I'm not sure the company is a Baker Hughes, I think that maybe and that might be a new company now, but um, in any case, they, he leased the drill bits. And so it, it was, it's a huge, uh, it was a huge moneymaker uh, for the oil, you know, the oil industry at that time was just taking off and, mm -hmm. and everybody wanted these drill bits. And then they started selling them overseas and then, oil, you know, the Middle East and everywhere where oil drilling was going on. So and it really did, the, that drill bit became the industry standard. So anytime you become the industry standard, you know, you're gonna make some money. So here's a question, hi Lorraine. Uh, did Bob Mayhew have face-to-face -face contact with him to the end? That's another good question. And I suspect our, our questioner might know a little bit about this. Uh, uh, the answer is no, uh, Bob Mayhew, uh, was Hughes's right-hand man during his years in Las Vegas without ever meeting him in person. Oh, not, not one time did Bob, Bob Mayhew meet Howard Hughes in person during that time. Um, they would speak regularly on the telephone and they would exchange memos. <clears throat> and the, the Hughes memos to, to Mayhew are, are really a, a great piece of 20th century history that I talk about in the book and that have been talked about in other books. Uh, but they would go back and forth, back and forth via memo on different issues. Uh, they also, again, as I said, talked by phone. Uh, Mayhew, uh, at one point, tells the story about uh, he was faced with three what he called huge decisions, multi-million dollar decisions that he needed to make. And he really wanted to talk to Hughes in person about all of these things that were coming to a head at one time. And he pleaded with Hughes, please let me see you. And this was in, again in Las Vegas in the late 60s when Hughes was living in the penthouse of the uh, Desert Inn Hotel. And Hughes said, no, no, no. And I'll tell you why, Bob, I can't do it because I think if you saw me in person, you would lose all respect for me because you would, you would see, you know, he didn't say it in this many words, but he, you would just see how how deteriorated I have become, you know, as a physical human. And uh, so uh, Hughes had, according to Bayhew, Hughes had tears, you know, was crying basically because he wanted to be able to meet with Mayhew, but he just couldn't bring himself to do it. Um, this, uh, let me get this question before that question. Did Hughes blackball any actors during the communist scare? Um, not, uh, as I understand it, not actors, uh, but he did uh, blackball a screenwriter, uh, which I talk about in the book, a good man named Paul Jericho. And Paul Jericho uh, was uh, one of the um, alleged communists in Hollywood, and he had written a screenplay for, for Hughes. And Hughes, uh, once he learned about Jericho's alleged, again, alleged involvement, um, he took Jericho's name off the movie. I think this is the Meet Me in Las Vegas. Um, uh, the, I'm sorry, it's called The Las Vegas Story, I think, and came out in 1952. Well, um, Jericho sued and or actually appealed to the union, said, hey, I wrote this script. You need to put my name on it. Uh, but ultimately, his name did not appear on that movie because uh, Hughes was uh, believed that he yeah. was a communist. Now, I know you could talk a long time about this. This is a question about the Mormon will, uh, <laughs> which you might explain sure. since we didn't talk about it. No, that, absolutely. And I'll, I'll uh, this will take a minute, but I'll be as kind as, as uh, <laughs> You can't have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, a man named Melvin Dumar lived, was living in Gabs, Nevada. He was driving south on the highway, 95, toward Las Vegas, ultimately en route to Southern California. He was chasing his wife, who had left him. Uh, and as he uh, drove south of Tonopah, uh, south of Goldfield, he pulled off on a gravel road. This was at night. And he was going to you know, uh, relieve himself on the side of the road. He says and testified that his, in, in his, his lights, his car lights shining into the desert, 
he saw what appeared to be a human a man lying on the ground on the on the gravel road. So he goes to check him out and uh, finds this man who has blood on his face, an older man with a beard, and he he wants to help him. Like, hey man, what's going on? Ultimately, he he gets this injured man into the car and drives him to Las Vegas, which is where Dumar was planning to go anyway. And the man ultimately asks uh, that he be dropped off at the Sands Hotel. Now, this story, this allegedly occurred in late December of 1967. Well, and, and at the time, according to Dumar, at, at some point during the conversation in the car, the old injured man said that he was Howard Hughes. Now, Dumar would say that he did not actually believe the guy when he said that. It was so outrageous, you know, so outlandish that it could possibly be Howard Hughes in his car. But when he dropped him off in the sands, he went on his merry way. Um, when Hughes died, and after Hughes died in 1976, Dumar says that he was working, he was working, well, we know he was working at a gas station in Utah, and that uh, a package was dropped on in the in the office of the gas station, and that it was a handwritten will, uh, allegedly written by Howard Hughes. And this will, which came to be known as the Mormon will, uh, would have given one uh, 16th of his estate to Melvin Dumar of Gabs, Nevada. So Melvin says, when he got a hold of this will, he's like, oh my God, I don't know what to do with this. What am I supposed to do? He ends up, uh, Dumar being a, a LDS, he takes the, uh, the will to the Mormon church headquarters in uh, Salt Lake and leaves it with the, the president of the church. And the president of the church gets this memo, uh, gets this uh, will, isn't sure what to do with it, ends up taking it to the court, sending it to the court uh, in Clark County, Las Vegas, uh, where this case is, you know, whatever is going to happen with Hughes' estate is going to be adjudicated. So at this point, you know, people start looking at this will. Uh, the media coverage is all over the place. Melvin Dumar is an instant celebrity. People are tracking him down in rural Utah to interview him about how Howard Hughes is going to become a rich man because he's in Howard Hughes's will. Ultimately, a court case is, uh, a trial is held, and um, it is determined that the will is a fake. It's not, not a real will. Well, for, for decades after that, uh, people, many people have believed that the will is real. Uh, and they have uh, wanted so badly, I think, for the will to be real. Um, Hughes did not leave uh, a legitimate will, and this was why uh, this will was taken seriously in the first place. Somebody was looking for something, you know, uh, to to help to determine what would happen with Hughes's estate. Um, I interviewed uh, Melvin uh, for my book, for the first edition of the book, and for the second. Uh, but the first time I, I met with him at the Clown Motel in Tonopah. Many people who've driven that road will remember the Clown Motel. It's still there. Um, and I met that was where Melvin would, would stop and stay when uh, he was delivering uh, frozen meat all over rural Nevada and rural Utah later in his life. And so I met him there. I talked to him about three hours. And you know, he told me this story as he had told it many times before. And I'm not an expert, but I believe that Melvin believed the story. In other words, he believed it was true. For me, I think the only chance that there's any truth to the, that he picked up somebody in the, des uh, in the desert is that he did pick up somebody, but it was not in fact Howard Hughes. It must have been somebody else because there's absolutely no way Hughes would have been, and that's a whole other discussion, but there's no possible way Howard Hughes had, would have been out there in the desert injured on a gravel road. It just would, it's not possible in my opinion. <laughs> Want to tell them that you've seen the, seen the will? Well, yes. Yeah, so recently, uh, relatively recently, uh, I went, uh, I asked the Clark County District Court if I could come and take a, a firsthand look at the Mormon will. 
Um, and they said, yes, we had to go through all kinds of COVID protocols to make it happen, but I was able to go and, and you can read about this on my website, uh, jeffschumacher.com. I have a, a piece about it, uh, but very, very few people, it turns out, have, have actually looked at the will up close and, and actually got, they've seen pictures of it, but they've never actually looked at it up close. And so I, I felt a great privilege in having that opportunity, but I'll tell you, it, it confirmed for me more than anything else that I've ever read or learned about this case that is not real. And one of the things that caught my eye about it was that it was written on the type of, of lined paper that it really like an elementary school child would use uh, to, write, to write a paper or something like that. And it was absolutely nothing like the kind of paper that uh, Howard Hughes would have access to. When he wrote memos in the 60s uh, to, to Robert Mayhew, uh, he wrote them on yellow legal pads. And you know, this was his mode of, of writing. And to, to the idea that he would find some little pad of paper that typically would be used by school children to write a will uh, is to me unrealistic on its face. So I have a question about his going to Cal, Caltech at the yeah. age of 18. I mean, he went to California, he'd been in Texas. Yeah. How, how did he get from here to there? Yeah, so I have an answer to that. Uh, he, uh, his, his parents um, were spending a lot more time in California by this time than they were in uh, Texas. And the reason for that was uh, Howard Hughes Sr.'s brother, Rupert Hughes, was a famous uh, filmmaker, screenwriter, novelist, uh, playwright in LA. And um, he was, you know, at the time, and you know, sometimes it's interesting in history how people who were super famous at the time fade into the background and nobody even remembers them. And then other people are remembered like it's yesterday. Well, Rupert Hughes was super famous and well known in America from really 19, let's say 1900 to 1950, roughly. And uh, so Rupert had a big estate in Hollywood. He was hobnobbing with all of the Hollywood elite. And that's one way that Howard, young Howard, became interested in the film business was through his uncle. Um, and so they were enjoying Southern California. They were wealthy by now. Hughes Tool Company was, was doing very well. So they, like many people, moved west to uh, enjoy the, the beach and whatnot. So that's, why, that's how Howard Jr. ended up in California. Interesting. Well, this has been a very nice discussion. I think we're going to appreciate the fact that you could do this. Uh, I have a couple of people saying very good talk. Uh, and I, I see somebody says they like the Mob Museum and they've been there. That's great to hear. Thank oh, you. I want to thank you for everything. Um, thank and you. we'll have, we'll, this is of course recorded and we'll have it up. Library will have it up within a week, probably. Well, so, thank you for the thank you for the opportunity, and uh, you know uh, I'm going to start watching these myself. I'm I'm excited to see what you guys <laughs> come up with. Okay, so Samantha, back to you. Hello, I'd like to point out that we have Jeff's uh, first edition book in our collection. So if anybody wants to check uh, check it out, you can place it on hold on our website. Uh, starting February 8th, we have expanded our locations and our hours. So if you check the website, you can find out which branches are going to be opening next week. I would like to thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jeff Schumacher and Carol Coleman with the Historic Reno Preservation Society and John, our Washoe County Library tech wizard for making this event possible today. Don't forget to sign up for the next live Historic Reno Preservation Society event on Tuesday, March 2nd at 5.30. The topic will be Dr. Heidi Swank presents Rural Nevada Projects. To sign up, go to events.washoecountylibrary.us. To see what's coming up, you can visit events.washoecountylibrary.us where you can see our download, our virtual explorer, which is a publication listing of all our virtual events and resources. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Bye.